Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. I uh, hope you all can hear me. Please let me know if you are unable to hear me or see me and also the speaker. Um, hi. So uh, now we start. Uh, this is our first NLP seminar for the semester. And here we have Dr. Gabriel Stanowski talking about his work from uh, he's from Hebrew University. And today is going to talk about his work at pre-trained language models. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Gabriel Stanowski uh, for the uh, talk. Uh, so the format of the talk is uh, the speaker will be giving the talk and uh, please feel free to uh, post a Q&A chat there at the or and and then we can interrupt the speaker to answer your question. So uh, the speaker said that it, he prefers more like uh, questions in, in the middle of the talk. So please feel free to uh, ask your questions in the Q&A chat. Uh, and we also have a Q&A session at the end. So now uh, I hand over to uh, Dr. Gabriel Stanwiski. Thank you for giving the talk today. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me. You can hear me, right? Uh, yes, yes, we all can hear okay. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm going to start the presentation with a, a somewhat banal statement uh, that language is everywhere. We can find language in um, newspapers, in medical uh, reports of, of different appointments, um, in, in, in law um, statements, in ancient texts, in uh, lab experiments, and in many other different uh, kinds of texts. And what I find interesting, especially um, in the academic domain, is that all of these have different um, disciplinary um, um, academics that study each of these domains. And all of them have interesting research questions uh, that can be addressed and can be um, can be thought about uh, in the lens of NLP. And I think that in, in recent years, uh, many of these researchers have been uh, hearing about NLP as a, as a thing, um, and they've been um, starting to get more acquainted with what NLP can give them. Um, and in my work, I'm generally interested in collaborating and having these discussions across uh, dis different um, disciplines and trying to see these real world questions and trying to address them. And what I'm, I want to do in this talk is to hopefully um, demonstrate the breadth that uh, we can go to uh, when, when, when talking with different researchers from different disciplines. And I'll talk about two, um, two projects that I've been involved in, um, very different from one another and very, very diverse uh, questions. Um, the first of which is about filling gaps in cuneiform tablets. And the second is about understanding uh, scientific protocols. And uh, let's start with the first one. And as, as um, Monica said, I'd be happy to uh, take questions as I go. Uh, feel free to interrupt. I hope I can see the chat. I can see that there is. Yeah, OK, um, cool. So let's, let's uh, start with the first uh, project that I want to uh, present here. Um, and this is ongoing work um, that we plan to submit soon. So I'll be happy to get any feedback or, or ideas. And as I said, in general, what I'm interested in is, is having these uh, dialogues with, with uh, ex uh, experts from different fields. And that way, I think I get to learn a lot about their fields and they get to learn about what are the capabilities of, of NLP and we can uh, answer uh, real world questions and, and these very um, um, real uh, questions and, and challenging questions that they try to answer. Um, so in this project, uh, we've been um, collaborating with uh, Professor Wayne Horowitz and Professor uh, Nathan Basselman uh, from the Institute of Archaeology at the Hebrew University, uh, where I work. This is joint work with um, Corinne Lazar, who is a, a grad student who's working with me. Um, so I, I said that I'm interested in this dialogue. So here is an uh, idealized version of how this dialogue went. Um, so they reached out to us and they described this um, process that they're doing when they're trans transcribing ancient tablets that they actually dig from the ground. And when they transcribe them, um, they need to fill in gaps that we can see here, for example, um, that are formed in the stone due to erosion over thousands of years. So this is, these are texts in Akkadian, um, 
written uh, over 4,000 years ago that they dig from the ground and they, they need to transliterate. Um, so, so we asked them, and how do you know how to fit in those missing parts? So you can see here, for example, there is a chip in the stone. Um, there's some parts here that are faded away. Um, and also here, and obviously this is half a tablet. And what they answered is, well, that uh, they look at, at the words and symbols that they can see in the stone. Um, and uh, based on, on the context that they could see around the, the cracks, they can fill in those missing gaps and guess uh, what is the most probable sequence uh, for these gaps here in, in the stone. And if you've been around for, for uh, NLP for the last two years, uh, maybe this can sound uh, very familiar and, uh, um, and, and kind of uh, ring the bell for, uh, for contextual language models and, and stuff that has been very um, popular in recent years. So a little bit about um, um, this uh, task. So we're dealing with the Akkadian language. This was spoken in Mesopotamia, um, which is uh, around the Middle East uh, nowadays. Um, this was spoken uh, 2,500 years ago. Um, it's the earliest attested Semitic language, and it was the lingua franca of the ancient world. And as I said, um, the task that they're dealing with is looking at these tablets that they uh, excavate from the ground, and they work at um, transcribing them. So they start by mapping out the actual cuneiform text that we can see here, um, and they write them in a, in a digitized form. So we can see that some parts here, are they start to fill in. You see these uh, red parts here uh, that were faded in the original stone um, that they guessed and some parts here in blue that they inserted uh, where gaps were formed. And following, um, they also uh, transcribed that into Latin form. So you can see that each uh, symbol in the Akkadian receives some sort of uh, Latinized form. And this is what they, they aim to achieve. And you can guess uh, some parts here where uh, the stone was, was cracked or the tablet was cracked, um, and they guessed it based on based on the surrounding context. Um, right, so uh, what we wanted to know in this project is whether um, contextual language models can predict those missing parts. And I think that um, one, interesting, um, one interesting part about, about this kind of task is that uh, the downstream task here for uh, the pre-trained language models is actually exactly the pre-trained task. We're interested in filling in those gaps. And I, I don't know how much I need to go into contextual language models, and I can't see anyone, but uh, um, let me know if, if you have any questions about this part. Is this clear? I think I can see the chat. Can anyone hear me still? Yes. Okay. Yes, we're able to hear you. Okay, cool. So I guess there's there's no questions, and and I guess people are familiar with uh, language models, right? Uh, I think yes. so. Yes, I think yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Anna. Um. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, what we want to train here is uh, stuff like uh, Bert or Elmo, uh, but on these ancient texts. And what we want them to do is to predict um, the missing parts. So, for example, here in English, uh, if we say uh, the doctor ran to the mask room to see her patient, um, we can, uh, based on context, guess that maybe uh, waiting room is the most um, the most uh, probable uh, completion, but also emergency operating next, and hospital are, are all um, possible. Um, completions for for this kind of task. <clears throat> so in general, the amount of data that we have is uh, very limited compared to modern languages. So there's a, a corpus that is that collects uh, transliterations of Akkadian uh, texts, and I was surprised that uh, the amount of data is still fairly uh, medium size. I was expecting uh, much less. Uh, data when they first contacted us, um, but overall we have around one million words um, transcribed in these 
in these uh, cuneiform uh, tablets. And we can see that they spread across uh, slightly different dialects and from different times. And overall, while this is maybe uh, not as, as small as I, as I imagined it to be, it's still far less than the amount of words that uh, was used in the English bird version uh, that used uh, 3 billion words. So this is by order of magnitude uh, smaller uh, amount of data. So I think an interesting research question here is uh, what is the um, minimum amount of data that you need in order to train these uh, parameter heavy uh, language models for, for them to actually, actually work? So uh, the first attempt that we tried was to use uh, just the training data, um, that just the data that we have from these Akkadian tablets on uh, the Aura corpus. And what we did was the same approach that is done for English. We took um, the text that we do know, and at each uh, time step, we masked a different word that we did know was there um, and asked the model to predict the missing word. And overall, we got pretty uh, abysmal uh, performance, and uh, this uh, failed when you try to train it from scratch. Maybe this is an indication that one million words uh, might not be enough um, to train efficient language models. Uh, and the second thing we tried was um, to fine-tune uh, MBERT, or uh, multilingual BERT, on ORAX. So basically, we take a language model, BERT, that was trained on uh, hundreds of languages, which is available online. And then we further uh, pre-trained or fine-tuned it on, um, on the Akkadian text. And this actually uh, performed way better. So we continued uh, with testing this kind of model. So uh, let's see some uh, results that we got. Um, so we start with uh, automatic evaluations. And here we can see uh, different metrics, and we don't need to go too much into the details. Um, but you can see here at the bottom predictions. So uh, when we ask the model uh, to output a list of, say, 5, 10, 15 uh, most probable words uh, that uh, or to tokens to fill in uh, within gaps, um, how, what, what is the position of the correct word that we know was there in the original text? And we can see that around, uh, if we look at the top five, we can see that we already could get to around 90% uh, performance. And this was a surprising result to me um, that this performs so well and how much the language model um, benefits from pre-training uh, with modern languages. So uh, by training with hundreds of, of modern texts, um, the model was able to pick up on uh, on patterns in, in these ancient texts. And I think this is uh, kind of surprising uh, to find out, uh, at least, at least, um, at least I, I wasn't expecting uh, this, this uh, model to perform that well. Um, and another thing that we uh, really wanted to do was actually to evaluate this with um, the experts that we are uh, collaborating with uh, that can actually read these kind of texts. So what you see here is the human evaluation interface that we put up. And here in the middle, you can see transliteration of uh, Akkadian text into the Latinized form. So when talking with, with uh, Nathan and, and Wayne, um, it turns out that there's around 300 people in the entire uh, world that can read this to some extent. And we were, we were fortunate to work with, with two of them. Um, so they can actually read these texts and, and translate them. And uh, what you see here uh, on the bottom, this is um, the predictions that our model is trying to address in this, in this part. And on the top, you can see the top five predictions uh, that our model made um, for these five missing signs. And, and on the right, you can see different uh, metadata that they work with. Uh, I have um, a... Uh, I have sure. a quick question about uh, uh, what you talked. Uh, before you said you pre-trained it on uh, modern languages. What are those modern languages here? Are they similar to Akkadian? Um, some of them are. So Akkadian is a Semitic language, as I said. Um, and multilingual BERT is trained on 100. I think the top 
um, 100 languages in Wikipedia in terms of uh, size. Okay. So some of the languages are similar uh, or from the same uh, language family as Akkadian. So for example, Hebrew is a Semitic language, Arabic is a Semitic language, um, Amharic is a Semitic language, and um, uh, Hebrew and Arabic are there for sure in 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 uh, multilingual Berk. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it's a great question, and I think. One thing that I'm interested in, in is finding out exactly which languages uh, help get this performance. So uh, does English, does training only on English would help this? Uh, I'm not sure. This is still an open question. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so for me, this was the, the actual application that I was interested in, uh, given experts um, the the tools to look at these kind of texts to mark some missing parts so you can see those red x's here um marking some um some gap in in, in the tablet um and trying to to guess what are the missing parts here um and there's a little bit more uh, nuance here that I, I won't go into in this presentation but uh here we need to predict the sequence of of symbols so we implemented some algorithm um um, with beam search to try and, and predict the most probable um, um, uh, span of, of, of symbols. So you can see here at the top that all of them are uh, consist consists of, of four symbols. And uh, what the experts uh, do when they look at this, they um, they can rank the different predictions or mark that some of them are completely incorrect and don't mean anything. Um, and for us, this was a major um, kind of uh, a test because up until that point, we only dealt with these kind of texts that for us, uh, we had no idea whether our model predicts um, something that is meaningful or not. And uh, this is the uh, current results that we have from human evaluation. It's still ongoing, um, but the initial results look pretty uh, blank. Um, so what we see here is different genres within, within the corpus. And we can see uh, the, the percent of correct predictions by uh, the, the, the probability of the model. So these are ranked by our uh, probability. So when apparently the first uh, prediction that we made is not that accurate. So uh, in, in one genre, we get uh, a little bit over 30% uh, um, that the experts thought that this was a good, good predictions. Um, but if we look at the overall um, between the five different predictions that we gave them, uh, in 90% of the cases, they thought that at least one of them was was a viable um, a viable completion of of that gap. Um, so to me, this is a I think uh, a good a good sign that our model is predicting something that is useful for them. And as I said, this is um, an ongoing work, so we still uh, want to. Um, elaborate on these evaluations and understand better uh, some of the facets of our, of our model. Um, so some of the open questions is, uh, what kind of errors does our model, does our model uh, make? Um, and I'm interested in seeing like how this performance looks like um, as a function of the number of symbols that a model is predicting. So for example, if there's a, uh, a gap of, um, of say five, uh, five symbols versus 10 symbols. Um, obviously, I would expect the performance to be uh, deteriorating um, the more symbols we need to predict. Uh, but I'd be interested in, in seeing that where, where does our model uh, break. And uh, yeah, uh, another thing that I'd be very interested in, in knowing is uh, what is the inter annotator agreement. So from talking with them, um, they said that there's a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, discussions and debate between scholars in, in this field about how to fill in those missing gaps. They don't necessarily agree between themselves um, uh, uh, about uh, what's the correct um, um, completion of, of, of stuff that, that, it, that is missing uh, and, and that they fight uh, as only uh, linguists know how to uh, debate these kind of things in very uh, heated discussions. Um, so yeah, inter annotator agreement I think would be a very interesting uh, thing to examine with the, with with the tool that we have now. How how often do they agree that 
uh, a certain prediction is a viable completion uh, in context. And as a question uh, that was asked here, I think it is also very um, interesting to see um, exactly what languages within multilingual BERT um, are helping the most um, with um, getting the, the performance that we see for this model. Um, yeah, so uh, at this point, I'd be happy to move on to the second uh, project, unless uh, there are questions at this point, I'd be happy to, to take them. Uh, at it. I think no one has posted a Q and A yet, so I think we can. Oh, but I see one. Oh, oh, there is one. Yeah. I see two. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, similar question, how does Akkadian relate it to any specific language in the Embert, and can we visualize any dependencies? Yeah, um, that's something that I find very interesting, like, um, and I am working with another uh, student on exactly these kind of visual visualizations. Um, yeah, so you can imagine some graph, right, that one language is helping some other languages, but maybe harming others, and I think, um, this is a very much of an open question, and we're collecting these evidences that people find in, in very recent conferences about just that um, um, multilingual, this kind of multilingual uh, um, training is helping, is kind of, of magically helping, um, and it pops up in different contexts. And, and I think it's, it's very interesting to examine this more closely and, and have um, more controlled experiments where you can uh, examine exactly uh, what languages help, uh, what other languages. Hope that. Are there differences across time spans? Akkadian okay, was used for a while. Yeah. Um, so Yuval asks, um, are there differences across time spans? Akkadian okay, was used for a while. Does the model fare better on certain time periods? So yeah, uh, for sure. Um, that's another thing that we want to examine. So um, the aura uh, spans thousands of years. So uh, it's like comparing uh, Shakespeare to Taylor Swift uh, in terms of modern English. So yeah, uh, we definitely want to look closer at, at the performance across different time spans. Have you thought about applying similar techniques to decipherment texts where the language is not known such as, yeah, that's a cool question. Uh, no, I, we didn't, but, but sounds interesting. Um, seems that you are tackling this task as an unsupervised manner, so I'm wondering what if you annotated the small data for training? Um, so we do have annotations from the data itself, right, similarly to uh, language modeling for English, where the data is self-supervised or um, um, so you, you can uh, create artificial gaps in the text by just masking uh, certain parts of it. Um, so I think that's some sort of supervision. So we are training um, the model on that. But yeah, maybe we can use, um, use uh, the experts to annotate actual gaps and, and see what they think um, is, is the completion there. I hope I'm answering. I'm new to this format, um, and I hope I'm, I'm answering the questions uh, correctly. Um, okay, cool. Um, so feel free to ask more questions and I'll, and I'll try to, to see if I can answer them. Um, so uh, the second task that I, I wanted to, to discuss is about understanding scientific protocols. So this is, will be a, kind of a, um, a shift from, from the talk uh, so far. But I think it does exemplify what I'm interested in working. Um, actual actual problems in 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 actual scenarios and, and that have um, real applications in the real world. So this is kind of the connecting theme here. Um, so in this work, um, uh, which is in collaboration with Alan and Fan, which are both here, um, and uh, Juan Tamari, which is uh, student at the Hebrew University, and he interned with me during my postdoc um, at AA2. Um, we, we are interested in looking at um, these kind of uh, lab protocols that you see here at the bottom. And this is, again, an idealized um, 
um, dialogue with experts working in, in, in these wet labs. Um, so the problems that they have is that uh, protocols in scientific experiments describe uh, executable actions in the lab. So uh, protocols like this one um, that describe what some scientists did in, in a particular lab in order to get some results. Um, but it turns out that they're very hard to reproduce reliably. So uh, you may ask, why is it hard? Um, these texts seem to be very objective and precise, right? So if you look at it from a, a layman perspective, you can see that this is very, uh, it seems very, very uh, fully defined. Like um, you have exact quantities and, and duration. It seems like um, there's not a lot of room for um, different inter interpretations. So we can see combining a vial, 50 nanograms of vector, um, with molar excess of, of insert, adjust with, so this seems like a very technical and, and well-defined uh, well defined text. Um, but uh, what we heard from them is that if you look closely, you can see that uh, many details aren't fully specified. So for example, um, what is thoroughly here uh, means for, for mixing, for example? So does that mean uh, five minutes of mixing at some speed, or does it mean uh, one hour of mixing? Uh, similarly, what does it mean to centrifuge, uh, centrifuge uh, something briefly um, um, that's not fully uh, defined uh, in their eyes? And I think that the analogy here can be for, for example, for recipes. If you think about uh, recipes for baking, um, then if you say uh, stir briskly, right? What, what does it mean exactly if you now need to execute it in a, in a very uh, formal and rigid environment where you want to get the exact results? Um, so uh, the research question that we are interested in this work is uh, whether we can uh, design a representation that is both lenient, uh, so capture these kind of um, lenient relations like mix thoroughly, um, but is also uh, executable. So um, if an expert would look at this and fill in uh, what does thoroughly mean, um, then that would uh, lend itself to execution in some lab environment. Um, so let's uh, look at a look at a few of the properties that we see in these kind of protocols. Um, so first, uh, sentences are rather short compared to other uh, sources of text, uh, like news or stuff like that. So overall, we have around four, 14 words per sentence. Um, you can see here that these are, if you compare this, I don't know, to literature or something like that, this is pretty pretty short. Um, there's around 13 uh, sentences per document um, that describe the actual experiment, and this is taken from uh, papers describing uh, biochemistry um, protocols. And uh, they also have very complex uh, co-reference and cross-sentence relations. Uh, so if you read this uh, first sentence, for example, combining a vial, what I read before, or something, um, and then you adjust with uh, the age 20. So what this means is that you need to adjust the vial um, with this parameter and then add a 10 a microliter, I think, obligation buffer and mix, and then add another quantity and then centrifuge briefly. All of this is acting upon this vial. And again, I think this is very similar to uh, cooking recipes where you uh, perform an action over and over over uh, the same materials uh, that you only specify once. If you think about this from the NLP perspective, this poses a real problem for um, cross-document, um, cross-sentence relations. So um, the vial is only mentioned once, but is acted upon throughout throughout the protocols. Sometimes even ten sentences later, without explicitly mentioning uh, what is uh, being acted upon, what is the argument of that uh, proposition. And finally, uh, this also specifies a list of uh, temporarily dependent actions. So we need to uh, do this adjusting uh, action after you combine something. And you need to add after you adjust, and you need to centrifuge after you add. Um, so there's a notion of, of temporal ordering here um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the protocol. <clears throat> um, so, uh, what we're looking to, to achieve, as I said before, is to have a lab protocol as an executable program. And this can benefit a lab technician when reproducing experiments. And as I said before, we talked with actual um, uh, people working in this field, and this is an, an actual problem um, that they're trying to solve, how to uh, reliably reproduce um, 
the experiments in wet labs. And um, I won't show this video because uh, we tested it before and uh, the sound doesn't work too well. Uh, but what we see here is an, a lab, uh, an automated lab where you can program the different actions and these are being carried out by robots in, in the lab. Um, so I think that um, having this kind of representation where you can go from uh, natural language text into something that is fully executable um, and reliably reproduced uh, uh, each time is, is a real need and has a real motivation uh, in the real world. And as I've been uh, alluding to uh, in previous slides, this is also similar and I think a lot of the uh, different challenges that I mentioned uh, just now um, are also relevant for other kind of procedural text understanding. So for example, recipes or um, text-to-code applications and many other different uh, procedural texts also have the same kind of challenges. Um, so existing work also by uh, Alan and collaborators um, presented uh, this representation called uh, WLP, Wet Lab Protocols. Um, and they annotated um, sim the same protocols that we're working on um, at the sentence level. So you can see here uh, at the top um, annotations taken from, from WLP. And this is similar to SRL or semantic role labeling, uh, for those of you who know it, um, where we have uh, predicates like mix here and the related uh, arguments. So mixed um, acts upon uh, the contents of something and uh, it uses uh, this specific method and there's a modifier uh, which modifies this predicate. Um, and we can see that this is, uh, gets us uh, towards the goal that we mentioned. Um, but one thing that is missing is uh, cross-sentence relations uh, that we saw before is um, pretty prevalent in, in this kind of, 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 um, of protocols and we'll also uh, quantify this in a moment. Um, and also there's no notion of execution. It's unclear how to um, take this and execute this in a lab. So for example, here we can see that the, we have three actions um, and we don't know what is the ordering between them um, and what is the, uh, the logic of, of mixing, for example, what, what is that, um, the effects of mixing two, two things together. Um, so this is what we want to enrich um, wet lab protocol with. with. Um, so our proposal in this uh, uh, paper that was just now accepted to EACL um, is to have this um, um, scaffold between uh, wet lab protocols that work at the, at the sentence level and actual low-level instructions for, for, uh, for hardware in the lab. Yeah, so this is our, our proposal, which I'll go into uh, following slides. We call it uh, process execution graphs or PEGs. Um, so what you can see here is at the top, we have three sentences in, in, in WLP annotated without cross-sentence relations and without a notion of execution. And here we can see that we have a connected graph um, uh, describing the entire process. Um, and it's lenient in a way, um, in a manner that we uh, allow these modifiers, for example, uh, gently is a modifier here um, of swirling. And what we envision this as a, as a good scaffold where uh, now if you're a researcher in a specific lab, um, you can specify what does uh, gently swirling in your specific setup means. So for example, uh, in one lab, this could mean uh, to mix at 20 uh, RPMs for 30 minutes because uh, that is what fits your specific uh, equipment. Uh, whereas in a different lab, this would mean 10 RPM for 40 minutes, for example. And similarly, when you incubate, maybe you need to specify um, the specific um, temperature at which you need to incubate and this might change between different environments. So instead of having to predict and commit to one specific um, um, hard-coded uh, decision for, um, for, for one environment, we hope that this representation that is more lenient can be then further adapted to specific um, execution environments that may have different uh, physical properties. Um, so a few definitions of how our uh, pegs look like. Um, 
for our graphs look like. So uh, they're directed as cyclic uh, labeled graphs as we saw before. And the ontology of our actions are based on auto protocol. This is um, one of these automated labs that I, I talked about before. Um, and th these are things that uh, actually exist now. Um, you have um, this kind of operations that you can perform in those labs in a programmatic way. So for example, um, they have actions like steal um, that take as arguments uh, the object to be sealed, um, the temperature in which it needs to be sealed, the duration. So they actually specify these um, actions that you can take in the lab and the required arguments uh, for each of these actions. So uh, the ontology uh, for our representation is based on, on actions that we saw um, in auto protocol. Um, yeah, and uh, going back to the examples that the example that we saw before, uh, we have two types of nodes. Uh, the orange nodes here are predicates, um, specifying again actions from um, from uh, from auto protocol. So you can add something to a container, you can swirl, you can incubate. Um, these are actions that have some uh, logic in the real world, and you can execute them within, say, uh, auto protocol environment. Um, and the other types, the other type of uh, nodes that we have are arguments nodes. So these can be physical lab, lab entities like devices or, or reagents, or abstract entities like amounts or modifiers. So all of the blue nodes um, here. Um, so for example, so culture tubes is, is, a, is a location, um, and uh, gently or 30 minutes is a setting for uh, the different actions. Um, and finally, um, uh, we have these um, temporal dependency. Uh, if, if you look at the different edges, um, we have um, three types of edges. So one, one of them are core roles. Here you see arc zero, for example. Um, so this is, again, similar to, uh, to semantic uh, representations like SRL or AMR, uh, where you have um, argument-specific, uh, predicate-specific arguments, uh, sorry. So for example, here to, for adding, this arc zero means uh, the element to be added. And for swirling, it means um, the element to be swirled. And this is based on, on the ontology that I've shown you before. Um, so these are the core roles uh, that we annotate here. And we also have uh, non-core roles. This is, again, uh, similar to a AMR notation. Um, these are um, arguments. Uh, that are predicate agnost agnostic. So, for example, for each operation, you can uh, define the site in which um, in, in the site in which the operation is happening. So, this add operation is happening at the culture tubes, um, and this incubate is happening at the site look at um, on ice, for example. Um, and finally, we have these temporal dependency relations. So, if you were to execute this in a lab, you first need to execute this. Um, this action um, and following, uh, you need to uh, uh, perform all of the actions that are uh, that are connected by this successive uh, um, edge that we are uh, annotating here. Um, so, if you compare this uh, quickly uh, with um, with the kind of annotations that we have from WLP, so again, we can see that uh, we add a lot of uh, cross-sentence relations, and we have a more clear notion of execution when you need to go uh, one by one. Um, in addition, we can reuse different different arguments. So you can see that this culture tube is being acted upon um, by different um, actions, uh, something which is harder to do um, in, the, in the WLP representation. Um, and we can also enforce the correct number of arguments. So if we have this ontology that we ground to, um, we know that swirling uh, needs to have, uh, for example, two modified two uh, arguments. So uh, we can maybe identify um, automatically that a protocol is missing some argument either in the text or because our uh, the model that parsed it uh, missed uh, the argument. But maybe this can be brought up uh, to the researcher who's working with the presentation. And kind of bring up uh, a potential uh, missing um, missing setting uh, that they didn't specify, and this can be that kind of a compilation stage uh, where we can um, identify this kind of missing uh, arguments. And again, this is something because uh, WLP is not grounded to a specific um, to a specific ontology um, that's uh, less trivial to do that.
Right. So uh, once we define this, um, we also want to annotate this uh, this representation, and this is a major obstacle in this work. So what you can see on the right here is an actual uh, uh, process execution graph um, for a real a real for a real um, for a real protocol. So uh, you can see that this is. Um, uh, fairly uh, long, and it's very hard to track uh, temporal dependencies and entity states over over long text. And you need to uh, validate the correct number of arguments. And so it seems that um, this may be fairly complex for annotation um, using using uh, sentence level tools or span annotation. So uh, if you're familiar with Brad, for example. Um, annotating these kind of uh, structures uh, that you see on the right here um, doesn't seem like it would be an, an easy fit to to, to accomplish. Um, and this is not a like a an outlier or anything. This is like a fairly uh, fairly um, fairly average average length uh, protocol. So uh, what we came up with, or uh, what Ronen came up with, is an annotation um, interface that is based on uh, text-based games. Um, and I'm going to show you a quick demo. And just let me know if you can see uh, the video. There's no sound. Um, yeah, so uh, the annotator can see the state of the graph that they're annotating. Um, and you can see here that they're interacting with the environment. There's like a game environment uh, that simulates um, the situation in the lab, so they can interact with different uh, objects. And they see here on the top, um, they see the, the 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 natural language protocol that they're trying to stimulate in the, in this environment. So you can see here the text of the protocol, and on the right they can see the process execution graph as it as it is being formed. Um, so what they do here is they run different um, operations based on the ontology, as we said before. Um, and I hope you can see here um, that there's also auto completion and stuff like that, that they can uh, use in real time to uh, to ensure the yeah you saw that um, yeah this 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 thing that um, suggests auto completion based on uh, the state that they're currently in. Um, so by using this environment, they have some sort of uh, rudimentary simulator for the lab where um, they can execute actions um, and the simulator ensures that they have the correct number of arguments, the correct types of arguments. Um, and this uh, overcame this uh, major obstacle of how do we annotate these complex structures. Um, yeah. So overall, uh, we um, we employed three annotators, um, undergrads, I think, or maybe grad students, who looked at these protocols um, and enriched 45% of uh, the WLP protocols to these uh, more complex formats by using the annotation interface that I've shown before. Um, and I don't have time to go into uh, the inter-annotator agreement uh, metrics, but overall we find that even though the task was uh, fairly complex, as I, as I tried to argue before, um, they reach good ag agreement levels. And this is thanks to the annotation interface um, that we use that allowed them to um, annotate this to, to a good uh, degree of agreement. Um, yeah, so looking at, at uh, the properties of this corpus, um, so overall we annotated uh, around 50k words, and uh, these are um, statistics that I mentioned before. We have around 13 words per sentence. Um, and each uh, document had, had more than 15 uh, sentences per document. Um, and if we compare this to other procedural um, data sets, I think this is where our data set is maybe the most challenging. So if you compare this uh, to Prepare, for example, which is another popular uh, procedural text understanding corpus, or um, Microsoft's um, corpus here, um, we can see that we have uh, more than double uh, the amount of sentences per document. Um, and I think this, is intro this uh, introduces real-world problems. So uh, the texts that we're dealing with are um, texts that uh, technicians in the lab actually need to work with. And, and this is indicative of, of, of these, uh, the challenges that we see in actual uh, real texts. 
Um, so a few other um, statistics that we can see in our corpus. Um, so we have a lot of re-entrances. So these are arguments that are being used over and over again. As I said before, we saw um, we saw anecdotal example of this, but this happens in more than 30% of, of the arguments. They're being reused in, in different, uh, different relations. Um, we also have a lot of cross-sentence, co-reference relations. Um, so the co-reference relations that we have of them, 90% uh, are cross-sentence. Um, and this is what provides actual process-level structure. And these are being missed by uh, sentence-level representation. So all of this is new stuff that we are adding um, that attests to uh, the new information that we're adding to this um, in this representation. And finally, we also tried, uh, once we collected the data, uh, tried two uh, approaches for, for modeling, a pipeline and a, and a joint learning approach. Um, so the pipeline model uh, breaks the, the graph prediction algorithm into uh, different subtasks and then predicts each of them separately. And the multitask um, model jointly predicts the entire graph structure. And I'll briefly describe uh, each of these. Um, so the pipeline approach um, breaks the task into uh, different subtasks. So first, we need to identify uh, mentions in the, in the text. So mentions can be either uh, predicates that we see here in orange or different arguments for these, uh, for these predicates. Then we need to uh, ground the different operations. So this add um, uh, span in the text is uh, a reference to a uh, transfer operation in, the, in our ontology. And swirling is uh, grounded to mixing, for example. So that's the second subtask. After that, we do argument role labeling, so understanding all of the relations that we have. So uh, here we can see that, for example, cells is arg0 of adding. And it's also R0 swirling um, in the following sentence. And finally, uh, we add temporal ordering between the different operations. So by pipelining these different subtasks, um, we can get to a full uh, graph representation. Um, the second model is uh, um, somewhat easier to model. We just uh, directly predict the graph using uh, graph prediction uh, models. Uh, I won't go into the details uh, because of that. Uh, but basically, we use a um, previous approach for uh, extracting graphs from text um, introduced by uh, Wadden et al. Uh, recently. Uh, but here, uh, the input is the entire graph, and we um, want to predict all of the, the four tasks that I mentioned before, we try to predict them jointly. Um, and uh, we have a lot of results, and I, I try to see um, if I can highlight some of them. Um, so what we see here is uh, relation predictions. So these are the different uh, edges, ed edge labels that we have in our data. Um, some of them are core, as I said before, these are uh, the predicate-specific arguments and others are non-core, uh, which are uh, predicate agnostic, and we also have temporal ordering. Um, of the diff these are the, the three types of edges. And overall, we see that across the board, um, multitask does better on all of these relation uh, uh, classification tasks. Um, and also, maybe not surprisingly, uh, we find that local relations are much easier to predict than uh, cross-sentence relations. So for example, if you look at reference, uh, you can see that um, it performs uh, poorly compared to, say, uh, the core arguments. And we think that this is uh, due to the fact that core reference is mostly a cross-sentence um, problem. Um, yeah, and, and to further attest to this uh, phenomenon, we also looked specifically at the performance between uh, within the sentence and cross-sentence, and we can see this sharp drop both for multitask and for our pipeline model. Um, we see this drop um, when we need to predict cross-sentence relation. And uh, yeah, also for coreference, we see uh, we see this um, relatively lower performance. Um, so all in all, we think that this data is a uh, challenging uh, data with um, with uh, um, challenges that are yet to be solved uh, regarding uh, cross-sentence relations, for example, uh, with real-world applications.
Yeah, so uh, I think I made it in time and uh, we talked about two very uh, different projects, but I think they highlight um, um, what I find interesting in uh, dealing with interdisciplinary problems and talking with experts from different fields and understanding um, what can NLP help them uh, with the kind of language data that they have. Um, yeah, so we saw that we were talking about uh, real-world text and small amounts of data, long-range dependency, and specialized language in both of these cases. Um, yeah, and as I said, I, I like to interact with uh, different experts and learn from them about uh, the specifics of their problem and trying to adapt them to, um, to NLP models. Great, so uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Quiet. Monica, can you give me a, a signal that? Oh, okay, hello. Cool. Okay. Hi. <laughs> yes, I I was okay. just having some trouble turning it on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. But but you you were able to. Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, please ask uh, your questions in the Q and A chat. Yeah, uh, I yeah, think uh, I think there were a few questions before on the event chat. I haven't noticed. Oh. And, yeah. All right. But. Uh, I think, but that was maybe for the Acadian one. I'm not, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you have to write the algorithm from scratch? What do the variables in that formula show? Why you use that formula? I'm not sure what that refers to, uh, Ray. Uh, if you want to write, if you can elaborate, maybe I can try and answer. Sorry, I didn't see this in time. Did you have to write the uh, algorithm from scratch? I'm not sure what this refers to. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I yeah. think uh, Cassandra and Ray, if you can cl clarify the question, I yeah. think that would be Sorry, great. Sorry, I, I just saw it. Yeah, even I didn't see it. Um, I was yeah. just, just checking the Q&A chat. Yeah. Um, Maybe we, we answered it already. Yeah. I guess questions. I have one question. Sure. So uh, uh, for, I'm just curious about the execution graphs, like how um, how accurate they are and uh, how ambig, what are the ambiguity cases? How ambiguous they are, like is, um, is there possibility for an ambiguity to step in and how do you deal with them to uh, to kind of uh, do these graphs correctly? Um, so I think the major source of ambiguity is uh, like quantities that aren't described fully, like uh, you need to stir, uh, um, stir briskly or something like that. Um, and yeah, what we wanted to do is to actually capture that ambiguity and preserve that in the structure. So uh, mm -hmm. we kept those modifiers. Uh, so for example, uh, yeah, if you need to swirl uh, gently. But other than that, I'm not sure if there's any more sources for ambiguity, but that's a good question. Um, so what kind of ambiguity were you thinking about? Oh, uh, I was just, yeah, because uh, you did mention these things like gently yeah. uh, and also yeah. uh, it depends upon the lab. What does uh, yeah, this yeah, yeah. mean? So I was just yeah. curious, uh, is it the external constraints or um, something, the language itself is something difficult to understand? Uh, so. Uh, so, so, so I think it's both. I think like fully specifying. Uh, like an experiment is something that is hard to do. So if you think about like fully specifying a model in a, in a research paper, that's very hard to do in spite of us uh, trying as hard as we can. There's always some parameter that you forget about adding, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, that's one uh, complexity. But in our case, we have the privilege of saying that all of the details are in the GitHub repository. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But here they don't they don't have any code to point to at this mm-hmm. stage. Uh, so mm-hmm. so they need to get some of the hyper of, of the parameters or hyper parameters. So that's one thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I think that it's also it's it's a bug, but it's also a feature if you if you can say that you need to uh, twirl gently, mm-hmm. then you need you don't need to commit to a specific uh, like physical property that might change between different labs. So maybe I'm as a technician in a specific lab, I would know what gently means in my specific context. So maybe like parsing directly to a physical physical um, attribute is not something that you can do across the board, but you need to do mm-hmm. it per specific uh, lab mm-hmm. equipment. And maybe, maybe it's that's the same in our case, right? If you need to do like a batch side, right? So maybe that depends on uh, the amount of memory that you have in your specific, mm-hmm. your specific uh, so- server, yeah. So while uh, to constructing the graph, like it, uh, I mean, does in the text is it difficult to identify which ones are external? I'm just curious. External constraints like this are they easy to identify? Um, I think they relatively are. Uh, okay. Easy to identify, Interesting. I think. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. But but these were trained annotators. I don't think this this is a text mm-hmm. that is easily crowdsourceable or in, mm-hmm. or in close contact with um, yeah. the annotators. Yeah. I think that's it. We are. All, we are at the end we are done with the mm-hmm. time. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much uh, yeah. for for giving the talk and very interesting work and especially like how pre-trained language models work on a wide variety of domains. Thank you so yeah. much. And Great. thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining us and we'll have our next talk two weeks from now. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks everyone. Yeah.